Welcome to the Blazer's Edge podcast. I'm Tara, and I am here this afternoon with Dan Morang. Hi, Dan. Hey, Tara. How's it going? Oh, my gosh. I am so ready to talk about basketball. How about you? Yeah, no, we're getting to that point now where I'm, like, kind of clawing at the walls. It's just like... It, the, the if if you were look, to look at the room right now, it's kind of like you know you get the calendar scratches in the wall. Like oh my god, how many more days? Yeah, like how many more days do we have until we get actual basketball? Because I mean, as we're sitting here recording this, I, I've got the the fantasy football draft on ESPN, their marathon that they have now every year where they go for like twenty four hours, and like it, this is kind of like holding my 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 sports sensationalism um, for maybe about a half hour. Um, beyond that, it's like, can basketball just hurry up and get here? But we got some good news because we got a bunch of stuff that's come out over the last couple of days. So if nothing else, we we have something to look forward to. We have some stuff to talk about, which I'm so excited because, I mean, we still don't know what's going to happen with Mello, but rumors keep popping up. Like the rumor about Mello to Portland just will not die. Now we have CJ playing pickup basketball with him in New York. With hoodie mellow, that's a totally different mellow. There's Olympic mellow, there's New York mellow, and there's hoodie mellow. You got to get the three personas down. I think we're really stretching it, trying to make that interesting. <laughs> and we still don't know what's going to happen with Kyrie. And right now, all of the alerts that I'm getting from Woj are all about European players that I've never heard of. And so it's just like spreading so, so thin. I've even watched some of the big three. Have you been watching the big three? Uh, I popped it on here or there. I, I, I turned it on to, to make sure I cut uh, Ice Cube beat LeVar Ball in the four-point shootout. So, uh, <laughs> I just that's, saw the highlights. <laughs> that was that was pretty much about the only thing that I've uh, that I've picked up on. So, yeah, it's it, that, that's when you know the desperation is getting really heavy. Yeah, I know. Well, I watched the first week of it, and it was kind of scary because it was like everybody came out, and they just tried to leave it all on the floor that first week, and it was like, oh, you guys. <laughs> Alan Iverson <laughs> you, almost you died. You need to ease into this. He ended up like 4-20 and... He's missing layups. I'm just like, oh, this is not the AI I want to remember. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's 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 like honestly, I mean, it, the the worst thing I can I can even imagine for myself and being in that kind of situation is like going back and watching younger me be remotely athletic and then looking at me now and trying to do the exact same things. And I'm like, ah, I just couldn't push it that far. I just, I just no. No, I, I I just couldn't put myself through that. The players that are there that are that are left that are not injured <laughs> that are that are still playing in it are it's kind of fun to watch again because it's it's some you know, it's just some pretty good basketball where they're not trying to play beyond themselves. And so, you know, it's not like watching elite basketball, but it's watching people who know the game and it's watching a slightly different version of the game, so that makes it kind of interesting. But yeah, it's not going to hold us a lot longer. But fortunately, today, the schedule came out. The NBA schedule came out. And so we can talk about some actual Blazer stuff. Yeah, and the, the best part about this, I, like, I've been hoping for this like as a, ever since I was a child, that opening night is finally on my birthday. Oh, like, is yes! that right? Yes, October 18th is now both my birthday and opening night. So when I saw Evan Turner leak that, I think it was about a week ago, um, I was absolutely stoked because last year – it was a week away and they kept talking about it. They'll keep pushing it back. They keep pushing it back. And like, now my dream gets to come true of having my birthday on the, on the Jumbotron at the Blazers game. <laughs> well, they start on the road though. So are you going to go on a road trip and go uh, watch them in Phoenix on opening night? We're, we're just going to kind of hold on to that one for right now. That's, that's, that's the, that's the plan, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Well, how fun. Well, so uh, besides having opening night being on your birthday, what are some other things that stuck out to you about the schedule? Now, just the way that this kind of schedule shapes up, obviously with it being a week earlier, there's a few less um, just bad situations for Portland to get into um, where they've got back-to-backs. Uh, they actually don't have a single home-and-home -home back to back uh, during the entire season, which is kind of weird. We do have our uh, home-and-away versus Sacramento, which for some reason every time I look at that, I just laugh. We're playing at Sacramento on the 17th, and then Sacramento is coming here on the 18th. Apparently that's our big marquee matchup this year. Yeah, we'll get some of those shorter trips, but um, I mean, honestly, that's good for the players. It's, it's good for the fans. It's really good for everybody because back-to-backs and what it does to the product um, between – the players not getting the rest that they need. And I, I, I just to kind of hit on this point real quick, cause I don't want to go too much into it. People want to talk about how they're, they're, they're paid this much or paid that much. And this shouldn't be an issue when you're flying this much and you're an elite level athlete 
and you're covering a couple miles, and it's not, not just the game time. It's the prep time. It's changing time zones. It's your sleep patterns. It's nutrition. It's eating in a hotel. It's familiarizing yourself with a new city. It's everything that goes along with that. And for players to not have to deal with that as much, I think it'll be a, a better product overall in the season. And you won't have coaches and organizations taking these opportunities to DNP just for the heck of it, you know, just to get rest. Um, I, I think that'll alleviate some of that. I think some of the organizations, some of the coaches will still do it um, just out of spite. <laughs> but uh, beyond that, I, I, honestly, looking at Portland's schedule, it's um, it's shaping up a lot like last year's. Um, the main difference is the, the tail end of the season where they finished with a ton of home games. Now they're going to finish with a ton of road games. But the meat of the schedule, December and January, are just going to be brutal again. And if Portland doesn't get off to the good start they need that we've talked about for the last two years now, they're going to find themselves in the exact same position that they've been in the past two years. Let's kind of go over sort of the um, the rhythm of the schedule that it's looking at. Like I said, we start off with a three-game road trip, and then we come home and we... Uh, the the Blazers come home and open against New Orleans as the home opener. I'm super happy that that is our first home game because we've got to get that taste of that last New Orleans game out of our mouths. <laughs> that on the road at the end of last season was terrible. And so I really want uh, to watch the Blazers come out and just take the Pelicans apart. So I hope that that's what happens. Portland's had some real stinkers against um, what what you would call probably inferior competition over the last couple of years. Phoenix has been one of those teams. Milwaukee's been one of those teams. New Orleans has been one of those teams. And you've got Phoenix twice in, in the first month, and you've got Milwaukee and New Orleans tossing there too. And then at the end of the month, you get Toronto, which I, I, I'm just going off memory here. I think like six out of the last eight games with Toronto have gone to overtime. Like, so that, that is historically over the last like five or six years been one of the best games of the season every single year, no matter what the roster construction has been that, that for whatever reason that that matchup has been fantastic. I mean, we had Dame's 50 point game uh, in Toronto where he almost brought Portland back from, the, from, the, from absolutely nowhere before going to overtime and just being out of gas. Um, so, I mean, the first month of basketball, um, the first two weeks, I guess, if you want to look at the month of October, is shaping up to be a, a really fun time because you get to see Milwaukee, you get to see New Orleans with a fully integrated boogie in AD, um, the new look Clippers, Phoenix has got Josh Jackson, Toronto's still Toronto, so it'll be a nice measuring stick without having to, you know, get bludgeoned with Golden State San Antonio right out of the gate. It's nice that we get to wait a little while before we play them. And then we, our first, you know, kind of significant road trip happens in the end of November, middle to the end of November, we do our that back-to-back with Sacramento, and then we've got five games on the road at the end of that month that's going to be uh, a, pr- a pretty long trip. I think it also is going to go over uh, Thanksgiving. Then, like you said, December, January, what's going to be the key to getting through those brutal months? If you look at the schedule between December and January... There's a point in this. And so, well, let's, just, let's just kind of look at it kind of a, a, as a block groups. Beginning of December, you have New Orleans, Washington, Houston, Golden State. Those four games are going to be just brutal. You're at, at that point. You're hoping to go two and two at absolute best to get through the beginning of that month. Then it loosens up, and then it gets into Western Conference and division play. You've got Minnesota and Denver within a couple days of each other. Sandwiched between that, you've got San Antonio on the road. And then you finish it up with Lakers, Philly, and Atlanta. So you you get kind of a front-loaded part of the month where you can make up maybe some of it on the back end. But then you roll into January. And January is absolutely brutal. we got to come up with the different adjectives because I think we've each said brutal three times. So no, we, br- brutal is the only way. I mean, it, it this, challenging the, 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 the schedule. No, the schedule makers it's an are massive. I mean, this is just absolutely phenomenal how uh, how this schedule worked out for Portland. If you look at how the middle of January, beginning of the middle of January, stacks up, they have a game on January 9th, and then from what is it, January 10th to the 26th, they have a game every other day. 
So they have a game on the 9th, the 10th, the 12th, the 14th, the 16th, the 18th, the 20th, the 22nd, 24th, the 26th. And that includes quite a bit of travel as well. That is insane. You've got, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six road games in that period. A challenge. Six road games. There's only uh, one back-to-back, and that starts on the 9th. And that's an Oklahoma City-Houston back-to-back. And let's not forget, before you even go to Houston, or excuse me, before you go to Oklahoma City, you've got a home game on the 7th against San Antonio. So in this mix, you've got the Spurs, the Thunder, the Rockets, the um, Pelicans, then the Timber, the Timberwolves, and then it gets a little softer where you get Phoenix, Indy, Dallas, and then you go to, to Denver and then Minnesota again. So you've got a little bit of a soft spot that you got a bunch of division games. You've got Oklahoma city and you've got Denver twice, or excuse me, Minnesota twice and Denver. So that's four division games. You should get in the span of two weeks. So my question was, how are the Blazers going to get through all this? So what's going to be the key to coming out of this? Health, health. This is the time of year where Lillard's foot just historically, it, something acts up. He gets tired. He gets banged up. He plays a ton of minutes. Um, All-star game can't come fast enough. If you look at any of the time that Lillard's miss, it's this time of year. It's December heading into January. Mm-hmm. That, I mean, that's that's just a period of time because you look at the amount of games that are kind of crammed in there, the road trip, the travel. I mean, this is it, it, with almost no time. Yeah, there's no back-to-backs really, but it's every other day. So you're just constantly going and going and going. And if he's got any, if his plantar fasciitis acts up, if anything like that acts up, if, if you get an injury to Nurkic or anything like that in this time period, man, this could snowball real quick. But at the same time, they could also hit one heck of a groove and really, really make a run because you've got so many games, just one right after another. If, if they're hot during this period, this could set them up for the season. If they if they go cold during this period, this could bury them early. I mean, that's that's how important I, I look at this part of the schedule is. So, since health is such a key, maybe we'll see more Shabazz Napier in uh, December and January. Every time we do a podcast, we hang up, and I think we never talked about Shabazz. He's somebody I think we're going to see more of next year if we're going to keep, you know, uh, protecting the health of Damien to make him go on last longer and be able to make it through these things. I really think we're going to need to see him taking some of those than, minutes. Than, than just him taking those minutes, I think we're going to see more of CJ at the two because you don't have crap. Mm-hmm. So you're so you're going to have CJ at the two with probably Napier out there. Or you'll see Turner at the point and maybe them playing a little bit smaller or or bringing somebody else into the fold and playing a little bit more of a unique lineup than we've seen in the past. But either way, I think CJ is going to end up being more important down this this part of the stretch of the season because he's going to be playing, while he may be handling the ball more, or the same, excuse me, maybe handling the ball the same amount, I think it'll be in a different position because you don't have Crab out there to eat up 30 minutes a night. So you're going to have to have somebody else come in there and eat those minutes up. And I, I don't think it's going to be Jake Lehman or, or Pat Compton at this point in time. So um, Napier looks like the guy who's going to benefit the most early on as far as how they're going to, they're going to divvy up those minutes. At least that's, that's how I would anticipate it would go. I hope so. I think he's underrated. I think that we forget that he can come in cold and come, I mean, like, you know, from just sitting on the bench, that, that kind of cold <laughs> and then come out and make a shot that he can make shots. He, he gets points when it's time to get points. He can get in there and get points. Even more than that, I think it's his energy. I think it's his energy and his tenacity in, in, in how he gets after people defensively. Um, there was a couple times last year where he came into the game, and even if he makes a, a, a turnover offensively or he misses a shot, his his tenacity defensively, I think, is a little bit contagious. He, the way he kind of – excuse me, the way he kind of attacks uh, ball handlers and the way he chases guys off screens and, and, and things of that nature – um, I, I think that's good for the team because we, there's not a whole lot of guys that really are tenacious in that aspect, um, it's particularly on that side of the ball. What about Mo? He, he can do it, especially in isolation. If somebody tries, I think Harkless takes it as a, as a shot at his ability defensively or a shot at who he is more than anything when somebody tries to isolate on him. Uh-huh. When, when, when guys try to isolate on him. He takes that as Harkless, a personal insult. It's a personal insult on him. I mean, some of his best defensive possessions I've ever seen were against Carmelo Anthony. 
And Melo tried to post him up repeatedly. Remember, this is kind of a New York attitude. This is where Mo came from. I mean, he, he's a New York guy. He's a St. John's guy. That that kind of chip on their shoulder mentality is something that's prolific in in that part of, of basketball mecca. You're like, oh, you want you want me one on one? No, no, that's not happening. And I think that's really been something that that really shines when Harkless is in isolation. If that translated to his entire defensive game, I think he'd be a top tier defender in the league. Not the best, but he would be a guy that you would look at on the NBA roster and go, that's not a guy that you want to attack constantly because he's just a pit bull. You know, and I think Mo's going to be one of those people that we were relying on in those heavy months of December and uh, January, too. He's going to be somebody who I think is going to have an impact on those. But to get back to the, to get back to the schedule, we got uh, almost we have nine full days uh, between the last game between the All Star break and then and afterwards. So there's uh, quite a nice little break there, and then we have March and we finish with a heck of a road trip, including the Texas Texas swing at the end there. It, it's, you get the Texas Triangle. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. Honestly, like last year, that those last couple games are probably going to determine playoffs or not or playoff seating yeah you got again, memphis we dallas houston san antonio denver utah so you've got one two let's see you get two division games and every single game is western conference so we we actually have our last eastern conference game march 23rd against boston so the 20 see oklahoma city new orleans memphis clippers and then memphis dallas houston san antonio denver utah is how you close up the season so the last what 10 games are western conference well, and hopefully we'll be catching Houston and San Antonio at, at the tail end when they're resting players. So if we're, uh, you know, chasing for seeding or, uh, you know, for, for position in the playoffs, should we be so lucky as to be in that position at the end of the season? Maybe Houston and San Antonio are giving some of their stars a little bit of a break. And because that's what happened last year, right? Well, actually, yeah, I mean, Houston, didn't we? We saw their full squad last year, didn't we? There was or Santa, one of the one of those teams we saw their full squad and it was a really fun victory. Yeah, yeah that was the Houston game where they just absolutely went insane. Um, I don't think anybody saw that game really coming. That was kind of the game during that period where we just kind of like, okay, that's probably going to be a loss, and Portland absolutely went crazy in that game. Um, so I mean, you you never really know, but when you're just trying to. Take a look at the schedule as a whole. This is like once this is out, this is when I start doing my real number crunching and trying to make predictions for the season. Okay. And so now that this is out, I'll probably take this and I'll do a, a little bit of massaging for it and then take some historical uh, projections from it and then apply that and I'll come up with my number. Um, before the draft, just kind of projecting into the season, the number that I was sitting on was 46 and a half wins. After the the draft and after free agency and everything kind of went, you know, the Western conference just got so stacked. Uh, I was more likely to drop it down. And now that I see the schedule, um, I'm, I'm probably going to drop it down a little bit more because the way things are panning out, this schedule is again, pretty brutal. And if they don't make it out of the beginning, which they haven't shown the propensity to really fire out of the gates. Yes. Adding Nurkic changes things drastically, but I still look at the schedule and go, if they don't really get on a run, if they aren't fire, if, if they aren't a, a well above 500 at mid-December, then things are probably going to go sideways. What do you mean well above 500? How, what, at that point, what is well above? Is it four games above? Is it 10 games above? Is it one game above? It's, we're probably looking at five, five to six games above 500. Uh, enough to give you enough leeway to where if you have a down game or two, you're not going to fall, just, just plummet down the standings because even though you've got some softer points in the schedule, that much travel and that many games on the road and that many games every other day, that is going to wear this team out, any team out. So again, I'm not hoping that they struggle or anything along those lines. Just history has not been kind to them in these, in these particular situations. Could that change? Absolutely. But right now I'm sitting on 44 and a half wins right now. And then once I run the numbers, I'll see well, what kind of projections we come up with, but we've already seen some projections kind of come in from some of the other professionals out there in ESPN. Most, more, most, more specifically Kevin Pelton's projections. When, when you're looking at that and how he projected out the Western conference, what was your first reaction when you saw those? 
So I want to make sure that I understand how Kevin Kevin Pelton's projections uh, work because they're they're very important ones that have come out several years in a row, and I think he has a uh, a pretty strict methodology that he uses. He bases the his projections on the players' real plus minus. So he looks at individual players' as, players' as <laughs> real plus minus, and then he, uh, he uses a formula to determine what the lineups are going to be and how many minutes they are going to play. And from that, he derives the number of team wins. So basically from a player number, he ends up with a team projection. Exactly. Yep. So he's taking, what he's doing is, is he's taking a projection of minutes played based on historical lineups. So if you if you're adding a new player to a team, let's let's say the Oklahoma City Thunder, they're adding Paul George to the team. So they're he's going to shuffle those things around and go. Paul George has played X amount of minutes um, at this position, at the two, the three, whatever. Um, here's how Oklahoma City's lineups have have typically functioned and where those guys have kind of plugged in. And so he'll adjust the minutes played projection and then take his Paul George's RPM historically and then apply those two together to get the new number for Oklahoma City for their new lineup. Same thing here in Portland. Now, you're not going to factor in the impacts necessarily of uh, Swanigan and Collins because there's nothing really to base them on unless he's going to take historical progression and regression from college numbers. And I'm I'm not certain that he does that or not for these guys. I actually, I did read that he has a separate formula for rookies that um, projects their NCAA numbers into the NBA. Um, But but back up just a minute. Let's talk about the real plus minus, because that's what this whole thing is based on the RPM. So as far as I understand, the real plus minus is uh, basically it, it, it determines how much a player contributes to the team's win while they're on the floor, but it tries to cut out all of the noise that's associated with, well, you're doing well because this person's in the lineup or you're having, you're struggling because that person was in the lineup or you are playing against this opponent. You're playing against that opponent. They're trying to come up with like, it's trying, it's supposed to be like a really pure number that cuts through all that and just says, this is how many this is how much the player contributes to their team's performance basically yeah i mean it, it's what it's going to do is going to sift through all the possessions of, of each nba season and and kind of tease apart um the the different attributes that, that are associated with each player and their contributions both offensively and defensively because the rpm model also brings out your orpm and drpm that's often that, that's and plus defensive. minus and defensive yes. real plus minus, correct? Exactly. And your your total RPM model is going to incorporate those two things together and give you your RPM. Okay. So it's not it's not when they say real plus minus, it's not just a slightly altered version of on court plus minus. It's literally looking at every single possession and how that that possession impacts each individual player in their contribution or deficit in that. It's a, it's the same kind of of, of technique that that researchers use when they're they're modeling variables over a significant amount of time so it, it, it's a way to, to to kind of like you said filter out a ton of the noise to be able to assess a contribution or a deficit on each individual possession for each player on each nba team and then come out with this basic number that you can then plug in for wins and losses and, and so so that 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 number is derived from, um, you know, all those possessions throughout the year. It's a very um, statistical calculation and, and they, they come up with something and the place where it gets more subjective, I would say is where he's Kelvin Pelton is looking at it, trying to guess, like you said, how many minutes is Paul George going to play in Oklahoma city? Exactly. When, when you're, when there's an unknown variable that you just can't account for, what you're trying to do is you, you're not doing necessarily best guess, but that's basically what it comes down to. You're using historical averages or historic or, or historical data <clears throat> on both Paul George and uh, the Oklahoma City Thunder and how they've employed possession-based data with, you know, a, a player of Paul George's caliber and positional status. So for for Portland, and this is where where it, for me it gets a little bit frustrating. Because this is a, this is not a subjective analysis. Um, this is a statistical data point that's generated using a model. This is not Kevin Pelton 
watching Blazers games or watching Thunder games or watching Kings games, even though he watches them, this is what the model is projecting. This is not, you know, a subjective, oh, you know, they didn't really do anything in free agency. Um, that wasn't real thrilled with their draft picks. So I'm going to keep Portland 10th and have them out of the playoffs and project them with 44.3 wins. No, that, that's what RPM is projecting based on historical data and the statistical analysis that RPM derives. And he has those, he has those RPMs um, for all of the players except for the rookies. And I believe he also has said that he uses um, overtime. So he'll average, like if, they, if, if somebody has been playing uh, multiple years, he'll look the, at it. The more time that you have, the more data that you have, the more comprehensive and complete the data set's going to be. So if you've been in the league a long time, then your numbers are, are probably going to be closer where they could be. Now, if you're a second or third year player and you've had one down year and then one explosive year, let's, let's take somebody that the Blazers are familiar with. Somebody like Wes Matthews, who in his rookie year with, with the Jazz, you know, was just kind of there. He did some things that were really special, but he wasn't allowed to shine. Now, when he came to Portland, he was given a much larger role. And you, your, your ability to project those things is very limited. And that's why you'll see um, some of these RPM projections are, can be far off. Mm -hmm. Because a player can have a breakthrough year or uh, a player can have a major regression who's young in his career. So the, the more veteran you are, so if you, especially if you're in that six to eight year, ten year range where you're kind of in your prime, then the, the, the model is going to be a little bit tighter. If you're outside those ranges, then it's a little fuzzier. So for, for Portland, you're not expecting you know these rookies to come in and make a big contribution. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're picking early in the draft and you've got a transcendent talent, like you've got a Markel Fultz or Alonzo Ball or a Josh Jackson or somebody along those lines, and you're expecting them to, to really do a lot, even though their college stats were great, but not, you know, Greg Oden or Kevin Durant or Mike Beasley, you know, these guys that have just been phenomenal in college um, and put up just ridiculous numbers, but... You, you, the transition because you're looking at different models is going to vary. So when people look at these, I think they need to kind of take a step away. You're not just from Pelton, just really from anybody who's doing statistical analysis and realize that these are projections based on models. Now, if that's, if that's got an opinion attached to it, that's where it becomes subjective. But when it's just the, the data and the models and here's what it says, then that's a totally different story. But isn't there a little bit of sub, uh, subjective subjectivity in the trying to guess how people are going to be used in their new roles on new teams? I'm look at look at the Pelicans. I mean, <laughs> who's going to be playing what down there? I mean, now they have Rajon Rondo coming in to play uh, point guard, um, and so how much is Drew Holiday going to be playing? I mean, they're all going to be shifting around, and so it's that's got to be a tough part for these projections when people aren't going to be playing in their in their roles. That seems like that would just make it harder. It seems like I would say the projection is is maybe less sure when you don't know clearly what roles they're going to be playing when they move in. That's absolutely true, and I mean, there's different things that I'm that I'm sure Kevin Pelton or anybody out there that's that's doing that analysis like this is, is accounting for. Let's let's jump to the number that he has projected for the Trailblazers. Um, he's projected the Blazers winning forty three point eight games. So these are none of these are round numbers unless they're just by chance. <laughs> he just goes with the uh, he goes to the decimal forty three point eight uh, wins for the Trailblazers, which in the Western Conference is only good enough for the tenth. And when you use the first question you asked me was what did I what stood out to me about these projections? And the thing that really stood out to me is, is that he has only four teams winning over fifty games. Yeah, no, the Western Conference is, is going to eat itself. That's alive. all the teams. Yeah, no, the Western Conference is going to eat itself alive. So, in in my mind, you've got the Warriors, the Rockets, and the Spurs. Everybody else is, is fighting for the remaining five spots. In the difference in RPM between the, the Timberwolves at four and the Blazers at 10 is basically six games. Not, not a lot. That's an injury here. That's a hot streak there. That's, that's a, a cold spell here. I mean, they're, these teams are literally going to just beat each other up and you're going to see, there's going to be two or three teams that break away and then everybody else is going to be muddled in there. And that's why I keep talking about that 
period in December and January where you've got a ton, not not necessarily just division games because Portland has the, the Northwest Division is the most difficult division in the NBA right now, hands uh-huh. down. There's nobody even close. Every single team in this because of the is parody, a playoff think? caliber. Yes, because every single team is a playoff caliber team. People can say that Utah Jazz aren't a playoff caliber team without Gordon Hayward. They are still one of the best defensive teams in the league, and they will still maul you to death at home. That alone gives them the ability to make the playoffs. The Pelicans, even if all that dysfunction with the front office and adding Rajon Rondo, which is crazy to me, you still have two of the absolute best big men in the league. And if they figure it out even remotely, they are an absolute nightmare to cover. So even these teams that are down at the bottom are still going to be really, really difficult to deal with. And then you throw Portland in there. They, they get a full season of use of Nurkic. Everyone's healthy. You've got some big man support now. You've got Caleb Swanigan, and you've lost your best or percentage-based best three-point shooter. So there's there's some question marks there. Um, I mean, you go up and down the list. The Nuggets, I mean, they're a team that, for all the dysfunction that they had and, and how Portland was so much further ahead of them, they only finished a couple games ahead of the Nuggets, and it took the Nuggets really falling apart at the end of the season for the Blazers to secure that playoff spot. The Clippers, yeah, they lost Chris Paul, but they have a ton of role players, and they added Gallinari. There's there's still a team that's going to be a nightmare to deal with. I'm worried that this season is going to kind of stress you out. (laughs) I'm not, I'm not even remotely worried about it. I think it's going to be a really interesting season. I just think Portland's chances for getting anywhere above the seventh seed are very, very slim. Like uh, the 60 to me is their absolute ceiling with the way things are looking right now. Could that change? Could could Nurkic become a 20 and 12 monster? Sure. Could Dame take one more step and be in an MVP caliber discussion? Sure. Could CJ elevate his game a little bit more and be an all-star caliber guard? Sure. But those are things that are I mean you're really really reaching to get to that next level. The, the level from complimentary player to role player to starter to above average starter to fringe all-star to all-star all-star to superstar superstar to mvp the, the higher you climb that ladder the bigger those steps get the difference between dame the all-star and steph curry the mvp that, that's a pretty big gap and i love dame but steph curry's arguably the greatest shooter of all time for dame to make that kind of leap he'd have to become one of the best three-point shooters in the league I mean that's that's the kind of that's the kind of leap that we're talking about. Okay, let's let's take a step back because we've got we've got the projections out there that that were done on you know on modeling on analytics, looking at the metrics that that we all have. When if you were given the charge with a clean slate, okay, Dan, what are your how are you going to preview the Trailblazers for next season? What are the what are the steps that you go through to put together a preview of a team and how they're going to perform for the season? Not like a game preview, but like the, a season's preview. What are the steps that you would take to figure out how you think things are going to unfold for a specific team? Are there particular metrics that you look at? Is there uh, footage that you go and watch? How much of last year's performance figures into what's going to happen next year? Talk me through all of that because it's preview season. I want to know yeah, exactly. how to go about making previews. In, in, in the previews that I've done in the past, because I've done a few projections here for, for Blazers Edge and a few others for, for, for Portland around the NBA, and the first thing I look at is strengths, weaknesses, and question marks. So okay. strengths, you've got Dame, CJ, and Nurkic. Strengths that, based that's... on what, though? Strengths based on the league average? Strengths based on, oh, I know this player is good at X. I mean, how do you, like, what do you hone in on when you're looking? What, like... what are the best single qualities that you get from either a team level or individual level? What are the best overall attributes that your that this team is bringing to the table night in, night out? So when, when you're looking at Portland, Portland is, is one of the best offensive teams in the league. They take care of the ball. They've got a great head coach who does phenomenal play work, both in game and after timeouts. You've got, you know who your scores are. You know what your rotation is. Um, Things of that nature. Those are the things that I look at. What, what, do you do you have defined roles? Let's, let's for an example, when you're talking about the Los Angeles Lakers, you're not going to sit there and and the strength is going to be youth. But, I mean, that, that's what you're really looking at. You, you're you're hoping that everything kind of comes together. When you're looking at Portland, you know what their strength is going to be. That's on the shoulder of Damian Lillard and C.J. McCollum and Yusuf Nurkic and what those guys are going to bring. 
Okay, so hold on. So say you were doing a preview of a team that you were like an some East Coast team that you really don't get to see very much, and you open up your page of basketball reference. Where do you start? Uh, let's, 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 let's let's take an example. Um, who's a Eastern Conference team? Let's let's go with the Milwaukee Bucks, because it, that's it's a little bit easier to work with right out of the gate. You know, you have an MVP caliber leader in Giannis. That's the Milwaukee Bucks, like the Portland Trailblazers, they they start in stop with Giannis as Portland does with Dame. Okay. So then you kind of go down the list from there. What do they bring besides Giannis? Okay, they've got length up and down the floor. They've got Chris Middleton. They've got Thon Maker. Greg Monroe kind of revived his career. Um, the, the versatility that they bring offensively and defensively, the ability to switch. Giannis can literally play all five positions. That gives you a ton of lineup flexibility. Um, they're still a relatively young team. Um, you've got Malcolm Brogdon, who had a phenomenal campaign. You're, can he take the next step? Um, so that's for me, that's what you're looking at. So your strengths are your MVP caliber player, their length, their youth. Yeah, so those, so those are their Positional so you start flexibility. Off with their strengths. Positional flexibility. So those, those are their strengths. That's what you start with. And you go, okay, here's their strengths. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then from there, then you want to analyze their weaknesses. Uh, with Portland, it's it's really easy to to define because their perimeter defense has struggled, and you don't really expect that to change because you haven't really seen any roster changes or or game plan decisions, uh, you know, over the last couple of years that have really affected that one way or the other. So perimeter defense still remains an issue for them. Team defense overall, even with Nurkic in there, um, it still struggles at times. Now, does he alleviate some of that? Sure. But over the the, the, the entire season, that's an issue. And if you look at the Milwaukee Bucks, their weakness is that they lack shooting. Outside of Chris Middleton, they really don't have a consistent shooter on the floor more often than not. Giannis is a phenomenal player, but he's much like, I hate to do this because it's, it's kind of hyperbolic, but he's much like a young LeBron James. He's very, very streaky from the perimeter. He's more concerned with getting to the rim. Um, Greg Monroe likes to shoot from the mid-range when he should probably be more around the paint. So there, there are some holes in there that you have to take a look at. And when you look at the best teams in the league, it's harder to find those holes than it is the further down the playoff picture you go. So wait, 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 question. When you're talking about weaknesses and, you know, you went to the Portland Trailblazers defense right away, you went to the Bucks lack of shooting right away, do you confirm that, the, what do, where do you go to confirm that those are in fact weaknesses? Because a lot of times there's narratives out there and sometimes you can look at the narrative and go, huh, maybe this isn't exactly what I thought. So when you're doing this, do you go and confirm those things? And with what would you confirm those? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say I, I've got access to some some tools that the, the regular movie fan doesn't with access to Synergy and some other products out there where I can see a, a little deeper dive statistical analysis on both an individual and a team level. Um, but that stuff, a lot of the stuff that's out there is readily available on NBA.com uh, and their new stats table. Um on basketball reference, you can see um, team percentages, individual percentages, offensively, defensively. You can see what their contributions are defensively, although uh, that those metrics alone are kind of wonky. Um, but this year, I believe, uh, heading into this year, NBA.com is also going to start integrating second spectrum. What's that? Which takes, which takes uh, we've seen it a little bit during the NBA playoffs. If you saw during timeouts or commercial breaks when they came back, and they'd, they'd kind of do a freeze frame on the court, and then you'd get the overlays with probability of shot going in. That's that's from second spectrum. What they're doing is they're using historical data based on the this that particular, let's say Damian Lillard shooting a three with a player closing out on him. They, they're using historical data based on the defensive player's length, their closeout ability, the speed, the timing or the speed of Damian Lillard's release, the release angle, how much time did he have to, before he caught it and got it off. All of this stuff is stored. It's all based off machine learning. Oh my God, what a world we live in. Yeah, it's, it's truly phenomenal. And this is this is something that's been kind of going on in the background now for a couple years. Um, I believe the deal was announced like two years ago, and I believe this is the first year that's going to be integrated into, into NBA.com's um, stat site. I don't know how they're going to do that or if it's going to be public or private or not. But I'm not exactly sure how that helps either unless you're a coach. I'm not sure that that how, how that would help a fan. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, interesting. That just happened. 
I think for the fan to go ahead and take a look at it in, in those particular instances, it, it's just cool to understand the 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 minutia of what what's going on in a much simpler way. Okay. Um, but if you're a because it's a drawing it out hitter, for you. Exactly. Here's what happened. Here's why it happened. Here's the expected probability. It'll, it, it can show you how special something was too, or how how normal something was that looked really special. Okay. I think that's something that's really cool about machine learning and and, and the, the the models that it can project. But with that, I, it, it's particularly more for for coaching tools and for players to better understand where they excel, where they need to improve. But as as an analyst, you can understand what positions, possession, game in, game out, are players best suited in. Okay, and you can see them trying to get to those positions. I imagine. Exactly, and that's that's take a player like CJ McCollum, who's really easy to point to what he does better than damn near anybody, and that's get his shot wherever he wants it in the mid-range. You know he wants to get there. You know he's got uh, uh, more than a handful of dribble moves to get there, but how do you stop him? Yeah, and you know he's coming. (laughs) Yeah, but from C.B. McCollum's perspective, okay, here's what players have done historically in the past to try to funnel me to my left or funnel me to my right. How do I keep them off balance? How do I go against the scouting report? Because the scouting report says C.J. likes to go hesitation with the right, cross over to the left, get to that right elbow on the free throw line when he's on the right wing. That's where he wants to get to is that right elbow or if it's the same thing from the left side. He wants to get to that left elbow and pull up or come across. How do you go against the scouting report? And for me as a fan and as an analyst, I like to sit down and understand the game kind of within the game. You want, you want to break trends, but not to the point where it's taking you out of your comfort zones. Because what defenses are trying to do, yes, they're trying to stop you on a possession-by-possession possession basis, but they want to get you off your spots. And that's what I think a, a, a lot of the statistical analysis out there right now is understanding is where do people excel the most and where do – players defensively where do they shine so if you're looking at it in terms of trying to determine what's going to happen with the team the next year you're going to look at last all you can look at is what the players did last year and where their success was last year and who had the most success keeping them off of their game i guess um that would be their weakness is um you know for cj did he get to his spot? And if he didn't get to his spot, what was the other team doing that prevented him from getting there? That's his weakness. Yeah, if you want to go macro on this, you can take a look at, at how NBA players, particularly Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum, reacted to Avery Bradley not making the All-NBA team. Uh-huh. That, that's kind of the macro of this, is understanding it. Even though somebody says that that uh, Kawhi Leonard, and he is, probably the, is, is the best defender in the league, or Draymond Green is the best defender in the league. You can make an argument for either one of those guys, and I'm not going to blink. But how Avery Bradley defended those two guards. Because they were feeling it. <laughs> yeah, they, they felt it you know, on the, in those games. They understand what he does night in and night out. And I think that's kind of the macro level of the impact of those players and how internally they, they feel that his game impacts their game. Mm-hmm. Okay, they so, they feel him uh, pressuring them the most, more so than some of those other players. They were like, yeah, it, you know, Draymond is good, but he's not out there bothering me. He's bo- out there bothering plenty of other players, though. Yeah, like and, and uh, Patrick Beverly, you know, uh, be, being on that team and not Avery Bradley. I mean, Damon CJ, you know, th- those are guys that are intimately familiar with Patrick Beverly. So for them to kind of, it, it kind of goes counter to what, analysts and media and writers and, and, and podcasters and bloggers have to say about individual defense, whereas the players, those th- these two particular guys in general, are saying that this is the guy. So I think that that's where we're talking about the statistics and models and all this stuff. It's all fantastic, but how it materializes on the court can be totally different from what perception is. And I think that's kind of the, the, the theme of what we're talking about here today. Um, just kind of getting back more to, more to Portland here. Could these guys be above where they're projected? Absolutely. Could things fall apart in Minnesota, the Jimmy Butler experiment, and all the young guys not working together not work? Sure. Could Paul George, you know, not integrate with Russell Westbrook and how he's dominated the ball so much over the past two years? Sh- certainly. Could Portland get up there higher? Sure. Could the Clippers really just not be that good without Chris Paul? Absolutely. But these, we, when you're looking at all this stuff in general, you're looking at projections and historical data. 
are there other changes? Sure. Can can you look at at what Portland has done? Could you project um, somebody else growing another stage? Sure. But that's what makes the season fun. But if you're asking me to take a look at this going into the season, right now my gut and the the data and the information that's available is telling me that 44 and a half wins is where they're sitting. And I think what we got to hope is that Dame doesn't think that's nearly enough because we know that he likes to overcome things. Yeah, put all the chips on his shoulder. Yeah, yeah. We got we to gotta hope that he thinks that's, that is not nearly enough. Well, let's wrap up how, um, how you would go about – how do you put it together once you've uh, looked at a team's strengths and you've looked at their weaknesses? What's, how do you put it together into a projection? Um, if, if we're doing typically what I do is I've done it d- based on divisions. And then once I finish the division, then I kind of stack them up um, kind of A, B, C, D, E uh, on where their strengths lie and where their weaknesses lie and where the question marks are. And that's where the scheduling part comes into because exactly. you're, you're playing your division four times. Okay, exactly. So you're looking at how the, the, the schedule stacks up. And, and this is why, again, I always wait for the schedule because if you get division opponents on back to back nights, um, in a span of four games and five nights, that's going to impact how that, that plays out. Because historically, you're going to struggle on a back-to-back. Historically, you're going to struggle on a back-to-back on the road. So when I'm running models on this stuff, I'm going, okay, this has been historical for all teams in a back-to-back on a four and five night. Because you can, you can, I can do data scrapes and pull this stuff from various sites and use that percentage to factor in whether or not I think the team is going to win that game. And then I just kind of go down the list, schedule by schedule, within the division. And then as that pans out, the more you do, the more the schedule clears up, as you already know what the projections were going to be based on another model that you already did for that team. So you're penciling in projecting the Blazers at about 44.5? Yep, 44.5. If you're, if you're going for the Vegas line, 44.5 is the number that I have right now. That's That's kind of where I've got in my head, you know, just taking a look at it right now with where things stand. And I don't know if that's going to be enough to get them in the playoffs. But again, we're probably talking about the difference between five to six games between the fourth and the 10th seed. If things, you know, kind of go the way we think they're going to go. Pelton has them at 43.8, number 10. And I have no idea where I put them because I just, I, there's so many, there's so many variables and what I, the problem that for that happened with me last year is I got totally seduced by continuity and I thought continuity, oh, continuity is going to be great. We have so much continuity in our team and all these other teams are like so mixed up and I totally forgot like my love of chaos while I was being seduced by continuity because the thing that's great about chaos is that everybody has to pay that much more attention because they're trying to integrate and so they're like super on top of things and you know two years ago when everything changed for us and actually Kevin Pelton's predictions that year for the or projections for the Blazers that year were much closer than like Vegas did so you know to give a, a little bit of a um you know, power to his, to his numbers. He Pelton's saw them. projections for the most part have been pretty yeah. spot on. Yeah. Yeah. But I, but so I, I, I was lulled into a sense of complacency last year thinking that, you know, having everybody coming back was going to just be cake. And I was so, so wrong. I'm so mad at myself for being so wrong about that. Continuity is great. Less continuity with better talent is better. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that's, I mean, if you're if you're looking at, at sports in general, very rarely does a team loaded with talent with little continuity struggle more than the team with less talent and more continuity. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely. Just, it's just absolutely. the way it goes. Yeah, and and I'm I'm more interested in trying to figure out what are the uh, what are the things that that aren't in those aren't in those numbers, and I don't know what they are. So I'll have to get back to you in a couple of weeks with what I think is going to happen because <laughs> I have no idea. I think I have to be in in the season and watching them play and watching how they're playing together before I can make any kind of projection about what is going to happen. Maybe I can come up with something before preseason is over. Yeah, right now, I mean, really, we're just a couple weeks away from training camp. And then we'll start hearing the narratives out of training camp of what Portland's, you know. What everybody worked on. I love that. I can't wait to hear what everybody worked on. I, I, honestly, I do, because if a player does come back, and I, this is the guy that I always go back to, is kind of like the gold standard, is, is Wes Matthews. Wesley Matthews. 
He, he every year he comes back with something else added to his game. And that's not something that most people can do. So if a player comes back with a, a no doubt new definable skill, that's fantastic. Like if, if CJ McCollum comes back and is a committed defender to the level that he showed in the playoffs against the Golden State Warriors, that's, that's a new wrinkle that Pelton's not accounting for. He got all that practice against Hoodie Mello, I guess. Uh, he was actually playing with Mello, so maybe some of the, the, the off. Oh, they the were playing on the mojos. same team. I couldn't yeah, tell. It was a very, it was a very dark video, and I was having, I was trying to watch it on my phone. I really couldn't even figure out what was going on. But yeah, I think we should go ahead and wrap it up there, and maybe next time we can talk about the things that we are, uh, we think that they might be adding to their games uh, that would make a really big difference. Uh, Dan, you want to tell people where to find you? Yep, as always, you can find me on Twitter at dmerang. Uh, again. You can follow me, send me messages, tweet me, DM me. My DMs are open. I'm always loving to talk uh, basketball, Blazers particularly. So uh, if you guys f- feel so inclined, go ahead and hit me up anytime. And don't forget to head on over to BlazersEdge.com. It may be the off season, but we are having some really fun articles up on there now. We're asking people things like you know, who is their favorite Blazer who never made an all-star team. I think there's going to be uh, an article coming up uh, about favorite Blazers memorabilia. We're all just kind of having a good time. We're watching the news, but we're putting up some fun articles as well. So This is the time of year we get to have fun and experiment. Yeah, BlazersEdge.com. Different... Find us on Stitcher and iTunes if you like the podcast. Subscribe. And Dan, I will talk to you later. Thanks so much for joining me tonight. Absolutely. Thank you, Terry. Anytime. time.